Power up. Power up. Welcome to Energypreneurs, where I bring to you the exciting new opportunities in solar power, battery, and electric cars. I'm your host, Sohel Hasni. I've been tracking and analyzing these technologies on LinkedIn and Twitter for more than 10 years. Now we meet on podcast. Energy transition is a big topic today. It means different things to different people. But the fundamental of energy transition is batteries. Our ability to store electricity has changed everything. And some people are applying that in a small case, like battery on your computer. You don't have to rely on the continuous supply. It used to know as UPS. But then there are large scale batteries coming into the system to stabilize the whole power grid. And this is how transition are taking place that we don't have to instantly match supply and demand. So today we are going to talk to Mark Kubik He's going to take us through many battery projects that he has been involved in, talk about the trends, what's happening globally, and some ideas. So please join us to find more. Hi, Sahel. So I am speaking to you from Saudi Arabia, specifically northwest corner of Saudi Arabia, an area called Neon. Wow. So I, I saw your CV, you are into energy storage. The whole world is looking into energy storage. So tell me who you are first, and then we are here to learn a lot of stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, I was going to go into sort of civil and structural engineering, but I ended up doing essentially a, a, a PhD in industry. It was called an engineering doctorate. And that was looking into the challenges of renewable energy integration for electricity grids. And that very neatly led into energy storage very early on. As uh, I'm sure you're aware, the very first sort of grid scale batteries that started being added for doing things on the grid were in the, the late noughties. So mm -hmm. my research led to essentially the deployment of some of the first grid scale battery storage assets in the European market. And I moved then from the development side of, of battery energy storage technology into uh, selling the technology, because in this very early stage, there was no technology provider that you could buy a complete working energy storage system from. So we had to self-integrate and we recognized there was a gap in the market uh, for that. So uh, initially this was through AES Energy Storage, who mm -hmm. uh, were very early in grid scale batteries. And that became Fluence. And I was one of the founding team of Fluence, who you might be aware of. They are uh, still today the leading or at least one of the leading grid scale energy storage tech providers. So I worked there from 2008 until the 2018, until the end of last year. So through a sort of startup phase, scale up an IPO. And then after that, the, the business has got quite big and mature. And so I moved into a new challenge. So I'm now out here in Saudi Arabia as a director of battery energy storage systems in uh, NEOM. And NEOM is building uh, essentially a whole bunch of sustainable infrastructure and uh, and uh, essentially it's powered by renewable energy. People forget that the fundamental of the whole energy transition is in our ability to store energy, right? Electricity used to be the supply demand has to be matched instantaneously. That's how the electricity 101 was, right? And then you yeah. store energy. The whole game changes. But I'm just curious, Saudi Arabia being one of the top fossil fuels, we all know, oil comes from that part of the world. Now they're also leading solar and now you are bringing batteries. So there must be a huge vision for renewable energy in that part of the world led by Saudi Arabia, no? Yeah, I would say even across the whole of the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, it's a mm -hmm. part of the world where the energy resource is fantastic, right? You get the, the best sort of solar yields in this part of the world. Um, there are a few select places where you also get very windy conditions as well as very sunny and the intersection of those two you get a particularly good profile for renewable uh, generation to be built but for i think a lot of the middle eastern countries there's a recognition that yeah it's no longer a sort of pick and choose uh, on say decarbonization versus cost right solar is often the cheapest form of electricity generation um so 
advancing that is is a logical thing to do right across the region and then very quickly after that happens as soon as you start increasing your penetration of renewables uh, particularly from wind and solar where they're they're variable and not you start to need flexibility in the form of uh well various sorts but batteries are certainly a large part of the solution there's a quite a number of projects in australia and all over the world then now as the more and more electric vehicles are coming in these are small 60 kilowatt hour modules of batteries is everywhere, right? What's your view on that one? You have a vision yeah, on I've, that side as well? So I've always looked at uh, these technologies as being quite complementary, right? There's a TED talk that I did uh, back in 2018, I think now, um, mm -hmm. quite a while ago, really setting out my vision of what I think the future will look like in it. I'd say I now have the ability to check in this eight years later, five, six, seven years later, on how it's progressing. And it, it was more or less around three pillars, right? One is renewables becoming the cheapest form of, of electricity generation. That was already starting to happen. It's happening in more and more places around the world. The second is whilst electricity generation if you, you, is relatively easy to decarbonize and get on, onto renewable forms of generation, you still have to tackle transport and heat. So... Essentially, the second pillar is electrifying everything, mm -hmm. moving essentially uh, the transportation sector onto to predominantly EVs, batteries, and then the same for domestic heat as well, right? The heat pumps, essentially. Now, that doesn't get you 100% of the way there. It gets you 80%, 90%. And then there are still harder to decarbonize uses for heat for transportation where batteries may not be in those niche cases always the best technology. But if you combine electrifying everything uh, with powering it all by renewables, you still have to solve the energy balancing problem, right? There's both a, a balancing problem from typically with solar day to night. Uh, with the wind, it's a, it's a little bit more erratic and intermittent. Uh, although there are general pat patterns of, of how wind is generally stronger at night and in the winter, for instance. And the What's the other piece? I forgot my train of thought for the other piece. We are generation. talking about the storage and the renewable energy and the electric vehicle on the other side, right? Yeah. So the balancing piece is one half of the challenge. It's fundamentally time shifting or energy shifting. But then the second piece is around grid stability and grid build. So it's physically in real time balancing supply and demand. And in a world where you don't have fossil fuel generation helping you with that balancing of supply and demand, you need alternative technologies. And batteries just so happen to be a very good technology for balancing frequency, voltage, short circuit level support, inertia, all the kind of things that traditionally were relied on, on thermal generation to provide. So those are the sort of three three big uh, pillars, and they all come together and are coming together right around the world, I think, for uh, enabling this energy transition. I recently installed a battery in my house, and suddenly you start looking at it. It's very exciting. Of course, the economics, so it's much better to put community batteries as opposed to home batteries because of the price. But again, the convenience of it and then the uh, security of supply in a way, in your mind that I have the battery right there, then relying on the community as prices are falling. So what's your view? Do you think the community battery in the middle has a future where there is a large grid size battery when individuals are also doing battery, which What's your vision for the future? Which way? I think you'll see both. And it just depends upon the market and also the, the historical context of that market. So anywhere where you have a, a mature power grid with the backbone infrastructure already in place, it makes mm -hmm. sense to use it and to improve the utilization of it. And one of the things, again, that energy storage is very good at doing is relieving congestion because typically lines are not loaded fully all the time. Like if you take solar mm -hmm. peak output in the middle of the day and in the middle of summer, is only a relatively short amount of the time. And if you take a, a line and build it to the capacity peak of the solar, you end up with a line that's only 30 or 40% utilized. So one of the unique things about adding storage to existing big transmission grids is that you can help optimize the use of those lines further, right? And if you build large centralized wind and solar uh, projects, that you can pair batteries alongside them and then build the grid not to the peak, of the wind or the solar output, but to the average. So you then are spending much less money on your transmission infrastructure, smaller towers, smaller lines, it's generally cheaper and generally less of a challenge from a planning perspective if you can either skip the lines or make them smaller, less big towers. 
But if you don't have that infrastructure and you don't have a centralized grid, then the decentralized model can be quite uh, effective. Um, uh, if you also don't have that reliability from the central grid, then the uh, bottom-up solution tends to emerge. My personal view is it's generally going to be less of cost optimal to build that way just because of economies of scale. But it depends a little bit how standardized you can make the products for these sort of smaller, either domestic or, as you said, community level systems. If there's a lot of standardization to it and you really can drive out a lot of, let's say, the installation costs that tend to be custom and costly, then you will see that model emerge as well. And you, you see both of those examples in the mature markets. And then, for instance, sub Saharan Africa, there is a lot of this emergence of, of more like decentralized uh, off grid or partially off grid systems. Yes, but uh, if you take a step back, this is when, if you look from as a central planner's perspective, saying, okay, if I could play all the pawns of my chess game. This is how I'll play. But then the way I look at it, average customer consumes about 15 kilowatt hour a day. Take some growing Asia, maybe. Depends where you are countries. in the world. Yeah. Now, emerging countries, much smaller. And if you have a huge swimming pool, a lot of heating load, maybe 25. But still, 20 kilowatt hour a day is a lot of electricity, right? And then the battery prices are coming down to maybe in the next three to four years, $50 a kilowatt hour. Right now, cell level is just just under 100, right? Today, mm -hmm. the cell level is about 50. So oh. already we're at that level. Okay. Okay. That's the, even better uh, than the pack or the system level. Yes. It's more than uh, uh, hundred. It is, we have to get clear on the terminology, but the actual, like an LFP battery cell, the prices mm -hmm. came down very significantly in the last uh, 18 to 24 months. Obviously, it depends on what you're averaging for, because there are cells that are used in grid storage versus EVs predominantly. There are different tiers of manufacturing, and then there are even different cell, should we say, generations or types. So the cheapest cell may not be necessarily your best cell for, for use, but the average is somewhere around that $50. Uh, if my daily consumption can be stored for $750, which is the price of a decent television these days, and this is another white goods have in the house, more and more people will buy them, right? So that changes well, I mean, everything, right? If you have your daily consumption in your house and 30% of the load is residential globally, the concept of peak and off peak sort of diminishes, right? It is different, but at the same time, you don't get that aggregation that you would at building. So you go from the domestic and individual dwelling, there, mm -hmm. there is not really a, a clear demand profile, right? Because it's very user specific or household mm -hmm. specific when yep. loads switch on and off. Now, yep. there may be certain things that are, have follow-up pattern, right? Cooling systems, for instance, like air conditioning, you might program to run certain times of day, and so there's more predictable loads. But generally, individuals have a lot more switching on and off of things, kettles and other stuff that is not synchronized. If you go to a community or, say, a city level, it starts to get very well averaged, and you do get these patterns that emerge of what demand looks like. Now, essentially, if you're building energy storage, dealing with the average is easier than dealing with the peak of any individual house, right? Because unless you have all of the peaks coinciding, which generally you, you don't. So I mean, for instance, with high... Simple. I used to do demand forecasting long term in a power utility in Australia. So demand forecast, we went through seasonality and all of those. What I meant to say, if my daily consumption is 15 kilowatt hour and I have a 15 kilowatt hour battery, so whatever I switch on, the battery will take it. And the, the Powerwall 3 can take up to 10 kilowatt demand. So that means anything I switch on will not go, except if I make a slot saying, okay, only take in electricity from the grid or my solar at that time, you can manage. And then average Australian homes about 2.4, I think, cars. And that means you have another 100 kilowatt hour eventually when we all go to electric at your disposal. So you have lots of electricity <laughs> sitting everywhere. So mm -hmm. the demand going back to the community, I can decide what goes to the outside world, right? Because all this can happen behind the meter, right? you have any vision on that um, and how it might pan out? I generally come at it from the other end of the spectrum, still large mm -hmm. centralized grid storage. That's my background, my expertise. And I still think um, that it's, it's not the same as the 
old centralized thermal plant world, right? You mm -hmm. still have distributed energy resources when you have at grid scale. They mm -hmm. are geographically diversified, but you get these significant economies of scale. And where so building battery storage next to large central renewable plants makes sense from both smoothing the output and timing the delivery. So you can essentially sculpt your profile, right? If you have a 10, eight to 10 hour battery, roughly speaking, uh, uh, if you've got no cloud cover, that's letting you shift, deliver solar all through the day and then capture all of the excess and then shift that solar into night. And you size your transmission line to accommodate for all of those. That to me, generally, if you've got the transmission infrastructure is going to be more cost effective to deliver low cost, and reliable and, and zero carbon power than doing it from a domestic level upwards. But you're right at the same time that if you do have a domestic EV in your home and or a, a, a power wall or a similar home battery, that you will have the ability to largely manage your load or even be off grid. And in places where there is no grid, it's going to be cheaper than trying to get a power line dedicated to run all the way to your house, right? To connect to the grid and it may not be reliable. So. Certainly that model, as I said earlier, it both will emerge and it just depends really where you are in the world. I see it less likely to emerge in the sort of more established mature markets with very you know, big electricity grids already, but certainly in places where that infrastructure hasn't been built, we might skip it and we might go straight to a more decentralized model. Mm, yeah, it's very hard to say because what you mentioned, that was the way if batteries were thousand dollars a kilowatt hour or even at five hundred dollars a kilowatt hour at fifty dollars a kilowatt you don't know people will just buy okay because your average consumption in my calculation is seven hundred fifty dollars if the battery price was that low right tesla power wall is still now ten thousand dollars but if it was below thousand maybe people will buy that extra white good in the house but the, and this is where this economies of scale comes back is why is it important it's because if you try and buy one battery cell you're not going to get it for $50 a kilowatt hour. No, but eventually if you, you will. A hundred, if you buy 10 gigawatt or 100 gigawatt hours of battery cells, you're going to get that sort of price level. So it comes down to purchasing power and volume. And yep. then, of course, the cell is not the system. And the smaller the scale of system, the smaller proportion that the cell is of the total cost. For a utility scale system, say a four-hour battery, given that a lot of batteries still being built around the world are around that four-hour duration, it might be 50% of your costs, something like that, 40 or 50. And if nice. you go to eight hours, it's more like 60 or 70% of the cost. But if you go smaller, as opposed to longer duration, you want a four hour battery, but you're doing it at a hundred kilowatt scale instead of gigawatt, megawatt or gigawatt scale, then actually a lot more of the system costs are not the cost of the battery, but it's everything else because the installation, the commissioning, mm -hmm. all these sort of elements start to become more significant. Like labor costs are, are, are well, not exactly a rounding error, but they're a small part of the total cost for a utility scale project. For a small project, they are larger. But again, it comes down to how standardized are all these things plugging together. Because if it's very easy and you don't have to commission and installation is extremely straightforward, then the costs for smaller scale come down as well. Yes, but my argument would be, oh, it's, it's fun to argue. We are, no one knows what would happen. Because you see, if we all ate at restaurants, which is cheap economies of scale argument, then you don't need to waste that whatever 20 square meter that you spare in a house called kitchen, right? Because hardly mm -hmm. anybody cooks, but every apartment, one bedroom, two bedroom, five bedroom house has a significant place called kitchen, right? Not many people cook. It's mm -hmm. just because that's what you do. So eventually, as home batteries become popular, maybe you'll just get it as an option when you build a house, extra thousand yeah. dollars. It's it's an interesting analogy, but does that does that support your argument, or it sounds the the opposite? Because you're highlighting there, yeah, from an economies of scale standpoint. Okay, and we're getting it's a, no, no, I'm just uh, for the sake cheap, of. But this, the, the point remains, right? Yeah, if it's not efficient to have one in your home, and centralizing would be more efficient, then it, it's the same argument. You're basically saying that the home battery might be like the kitchen for, for a yeah, home. Yeah, people right? will it have it anyway. Less efficient, but people will do it anyway, is what yeah, you're saying. That's what I meant. People will have it anyway because it's not going to be very expensive. But it is interesting uh, how it will pan out. But in a large-scale storage space that on-grid very large batteries, uh, how is the market right now? How many batteries are 
how the market is going overall? Do you want to give a feel for? Yeah, let, let's use, so we're not fully through 2024. So let's take end of 2023, roughly. So there's about one terawatt hours of batteries in EVs in the world as of the end of last year. And there's about 100 gigawatt hours of battery batteries for stationary storage applications. There's wow. also, of course, billions of devices like watches, lap pads, tablets, uh, power tools, etc., which are a rounding error in the total lithium ion battery deployment numbers. It's less than a percent. It's not very significant. So roughly speaking, 90% of the market at the end of last year was going into EVs, 10% into stationary grid storage. First thing to say is that trend is starting to change. Um, EVs are still growing. And so they're, they're absolute amount is growing, but there's been a relative slowdown, whilst there's been a relative speed up on grid stationary storage. There's not a firm answer on, on this yet, but the various analysts and various reports I see are looking more like it will start to grow to a 20% stationary storage share because of this explosive growth for, uh, for electricity grids. And the reason for that is as batteries are becoming cheaper and mm -hmm. every doubling of, of installed capacity or production, there's about a 20 to 30% reduction in the battery storage cell costs. That drives some very significant economies of scale that are very neatly self-reinforcing because as the batteries get cheaper, there's more things you can do with them, right? Mm -hmm. We started off with very short duration batteries 15 years ago on the grid that were doing generally just frequency regulation. So you didn't need a lot of energy capacity for that because it's just balancing supply and demand fluctuating up and down second to second then we started to get into peaking uses right so then you start to see two hours four hour batteries where you're dealing with evening peak demand and you're for instance shifting solar from the middle of the afternoon and just as the solar is coming off and the sun is setting your demand is going up and that's a very steep ramp and change so most batteries today are still being built more in this two to four hour time scale but with the cost reductions, it now gets to a point where we're starting to see six, eight, 10 hour battery storage becoming cost competitive as well. So when you take solar plus a battery, you can more or less get your base load power now, which was always considered a bit of the holy grail or silver bullet. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's quite perfect, but that lets you essentially deliver a, a reliable energy system as long as you can deal with your long-term power interruptions as well right because there's days where it's not necessarily always going to be sunny so you still have to think about that but if you just look at the energy plus storage costs those start to look very competitive now and as you see more and more eight hour systems deployed that drives even more volume right so it's quite self-reinforcing that the costs are coming down very rapidly as a result of this at the same time, density continues to improve for battery cells. Performance continues to improve. So you can pack them in a smaller footprint and they'll last more cycles. So, uh, so their lifetime is extended versus what they, they were before. So these are all the current trends. And as a result of that, we're also starting to see a bit more specialization of the technology as well. So the battery cells used to be all the same. You basically take the ones that were used in cars or buses or whatever EVs you're looking at, and then use them in grid storage. But actually your priorities are a little bit different for, for stationary storage than they are for EVs, right? In EVs you care about, of course you care about safety in both cases, but especially in passenger EVs, safety is extremely high and density matters because the sort of size mm -hmm. of your vehicle is fixed. So you care about different priorities in EVs than you might for stationary storage where the lifetime of the the asset is very important, but perhaps the footprint is not quite such the most important thing to think about. Yeah, and also EVs, you want to do your uh, 100 kilometer per hour in three seconds or something, right? You need that mm -hmm. rapid discharge, which oh. you may not need in a house that much or in a, any it, other situation. Exactly. Yeah, so that, that, that is a big difference. The C rate, uh, so-called right power to energy ratio of your battery and what it can handle. So yeah, in a in a a car or some kind of high performance vehicle, you want to press the, the pedal and get a boost of power and really go fast. You need to have batteries that are able to operate at a high C rate. But for stationary storage, especially as we go to these longer and longer durations, the C rate becomes lower and lower. So I, I don't know if your uh, listeners are always familiar with it. Maybe I should explain the concept. So C rate is basically uh, in simple terms, power to energy ratio. So a one hour battery, it's one megawatt can discharge for one hour would be one C. A battery that uh, can do one megawatt, but 
in uh, basically twice the speed would be a 2C battery, so in half an hour. If you go to double two-hour duration, it's operating at basically half the ratio. So half C, four-hour system, 0.25. So exactly this point, you take a four-hour system or an eight-hour system, C rate is 0.25 or 0.125. It's very low compared to an EV. Now, operating at a lower C rate is good for battery life because mm -hmm. it can cycle more at this lower C rate for a longer time and it gets less hot. So that means you have lower cooling requirements. So if you optimize for longer duration and you'll generally need longer duration types of storage in either the home or on the grid for uh, enabling energy resilience, you find that you're needing a, a cell with different characteristics or priorities compared to an EV where you care about that rapid acceleration and maybe you want two, three, four, five, five C. So you can really go powerful and fast. Yeah, this uh, classification is very important because when you're putting in a house, you really don't care or a stationary situation, how energy dense is because your focus is very much on the price. Whereas if you put in a car or any other place, it's a mobile, you want it to be lighter or denser because more kilowatt hour per kilogram, right? Mm. So having said all yeah. of those, I hear sometimes people say for stationary, maybe sodium batteries may become more popular than lithium or LFP batteries in general. Or some people even argue, those who are into the concentrated solar power industry, maybe a very large one, molten salt as a storage, of course, is a solar thermal, is a better. Do you have any personal preference or any views as to which way we are headed? So, yeah, I do have a personal opinion. Of course, it's always good to have opinions. The way I would look at it is there's, there's a lot of talk about what long duration energy storage is. And there for a long mm -hmm. time hasn't been a definition of that. What is LDES? And... The sort of DOE, Department of Energy, the definition in the US has come out at this eight hour plus duration. Mm -hmm. And if you take that definition, then lithium ion is already an LDES technology, right? Because we, we're already seeing eight hour lithium ion battery systems being built in the world. And in the near term, it's a very difficult technology to see being overtaken in this sort of, I would say, daily storage space. So you actually don't need to go beyond 10, 10 to 12 hours, maybe maximum for a daily storage need, right? Because you're shifting solar from day to night predominantly, and you don't need any more than that. It's only when you get into longer term resiliency, multiple days of low wind and low sun, that you have a different kind of multi-day storage need emerging. And today, it really depends when you're building your project. Because if you ask me today to sign a, a project on the economics that are in front of us, then pumped hydro, as the sort of mature long duration storage class is probably the still te the technology you would build for, so we say eight hours plus. But it, it will take seven or eight years to build. <laughs> exactly, you stole my point, right? But <laughs> the point is the cost curve for lithium ion is improving year on year. You can't absolutely rely on it, but it is also quite mathematically probable following the, the patterns of what we've seen historically. So by the time you wait five years, and you can build your battery in a year or two instead of seven years, it will be cheaper for that use case as well. I, I see lithium ion in the near term is very difficult to assail, but it will never be the technology, I think, of choice, maybe never say never, but for, say, multi-day storage needs, which today, you the most competitive is, for the most part, lithium ion until you get, sorry, uh, pumped hydro, until you get to really long durations. And then you emerge into things like potentially compressed air or, or hydrogen. But your question on, on sodium ion, I, I do think sodium ion, at least on paper, right, it should be in the long run cheaper. If you could get it to the same economies of scale as lithium ion, the raw material costs are lower because it's salt and salt is cheaper than, than lithium by a factor of 10. So if you can get the cost down, it, you'll see sodium ion potentially take a share of this longer longer duration space because the the cost is an important driver. However, the density of sodium ion and the, the cycle life of sodium ion is also not as good. So there's a lot of things that still need to improve, but I do think that is a technology that has good potential, especially because it's very easily substitutable, right? You can take a lithium ion battery cell and swap it for a sodium ion cell relatively easily compared to if you take a very, like a flow battery or something, it's a very different technology class. It's not easily mm -hmm. substituted into the same standardized supply chain. So in summary, lithium ion dominating, I think, for the foreseeable future, because it's just on such an aggressive improvement curve still. 
for multi-day use, there's still a lot more uncertainty as to what to emerge. And there may be some technologies that find their sweet spots, the, the sort of somewhere in between duration of the 8, 10 or 12 hour space. Yeah, the simplest way I look at it saying car needs lighter batteries and lithium is number one in the periodic table. So nothing can be as light as lithium, like sodium is way down, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. if you need light, lithium maybe, but yes, for a stationary storage yeah. where you don't have issue of weight, it could be very different. But this is the thing, and it is interesting because actually the first uses I've seen of sodium ion are actually, be, actually being in the EV space rather than the grid space, which doesn't sound intuitive based on what you just said. But the reason actually is the, the performance point, which we did talk about a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. right? So for grid storage, one of the biggest drivers, aside from obviously the cost, density is, okay, you, you said early density is not important in the home or in the, in the field. Of course, it still is important. If it takes up half your garage or whatever, it, it matters. Saying that land obviously does cost money, but it's not as sensitive. What it is really sensitive to is it going to last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, mm -hmm. right? That cycle life really does matter. And sodium iron actually doesn't have a very high cycle life, but that matters less for a car because a car doesn't cycle anywhere near as much as a grid battery. Like a grid battery will cycle once a day. A typical EV will cycle once per week. Now, there are mm -hmm. exceptions, taxi fleets and delivery trucks and so on, but the average user of a, an electric vehicle will cycle their battery only a seventh of the amount. So actually your total number of cycles that you need is much less because the lifetime of your is going to not be really necessarily driven by your battery. It's going to be driven by the rest of the, the vehicle and how long an owner wants to keep it before they, they get a new model. So that's why I've actually heard, and I think I you know, share, share the view that there might be uh, a place for sodium ion in EVs, despite the, the low density and therefore more weight for, for you, yeah. if the cost is low enough. Yeah, obviously. But again, if it become $20 a kilowatt hour, then it's a 20 or 23 or 30. It doesn't matter that much because it's already mm. so low because the alternative, the fossil fuel cars are, their costs are not going to come down because 80% of energy input is going to generate heat. So they cannot Absolutely. get away. Efficiency is not going to improve dramatically, right? So mm -hmm. do you worry about recycling of lithium much? A lot of people worry so, because no. they relate battery to lead acid, but lithium is a naturally occurring thing. Do you have any views on this? I, I don't worry about it so much as worry about the perceptions about people yep. worrying about it, if that makes yep. sense. Lithium, yeah, there's a few, I would say, debunked topics that still keep cropping up to do with lithium ion battery recycling. The first is a perception that very few lithium ion batteries are actually recycled, which is not true, right? When you look at the critical materials that go into them, the recycling rates are very high, right? In China, CATL, the largest cell manufacturer in the world, has a 91% recovery rate for lithium already from batteries being taken back to be recycled. For things like nickel and cobalt and NMC batteries, it's more like 99%. It's very high recovery rates already. The, the thing that gets confused in recycling is the, the actual collection or recycling rate. And there are some good resources on this to, to debunk the difference because the reason that collection rates are quite low is actually ironically a good thing. It's because when you take it and you make an assumption about its end of life, most people or analysts in the past took the assumption that you look at the warranty period of, of the car, which is typically eight years for the battery, and you assume after eight years, the battery is going to be scrapped and recycled, right? That doesn't happen in practice. Why? First of all, because the batteries actually last a lot longer than you expect them to under the warranty. Right? Bear in mind the cycling use is low. There's still a substantial amount of usable capacity in those batteries. So they end up lasting more years. And so the recycling volumes are not appearing because these cars actually last longer, first of all. Second of all, is rather than scrapping your car, people keep using them. Right? Who says 70% or 80% state of health is not good enough in a car, right? You can keep using it down to 60, 50, 40, right? It, it, it reduces your range. Your yeah. brand new car will give you 450 yeah. kilometer range. I'll be happy if I'm just doing shopping with a 50 kilometer range. Why do I care? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you, what you'd find is that their batteries are not being recycled because they're still being used, yeah. which is a good thing. 
That's one. And then the second is even if you aren't happy with your car and you want to buy a new one, you'll sell it to someone else rather than send it to a scrap heap, right? To, to be recycled. So there's a secondary market and you see this around the world, like typically cars change hands, have multiple owners and continues to be used. And it's essentially the same with grid storage. Some of the first assets that I was involved in when they reached their end of life, rather than being recycled, this was actually around the time of um, Hurricane uh, Maria in the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, places like that were hit by these hurricanes. And actually the decision was made, okay, the useful life of, of these battery assets in the US market has reached their end, but rather than send them to be recycled, they were donated to, to basically the sort of rebuilding effort, right? To provide solar plus batteries to essentially provide power when the infrastructure should be removed. So there's also this second life concept as well, beyond the first life, that, that is also a reason that we don't see very significant volumes of, of recycling. Um, and then the final thing is, it's all happening in China. So again, a lot of the rest of the world, the perception is there's no recycling here. So it's not the reason it's happening in China is that China has the need for the raw materials once they have been processed, right? Mm-hmm. Where, where do you need new lithium, processed lithium? It's right back where the lithium ion batteries are being made. So there is actually very significant recycling capacity. It's the opposite problem that people think. Uh, there's actually way more recycling capacity than there is end of life material to recycle because of some of these yeah, underestimations, shall we say, of how long batteries would last. Yeah, I think the concept is expert like yourself have to explain because when we think about battery, we think, okay, this is my remote control. I take the battery, chuck it in the bin or wherever, and I buy a new battery. But electric car batteries are not like that. It's not going to drop dead. It will slowly no. go down. That's what I understand, no? Yeah, yeah. it's the difference between... So, I mean, your TV remote battery is a one-use only battery, right? So it, it does discharge down to zero, and then it's one-use only. I did have someone in the early days who didn't understand... Uh, when I was speaking to about grid storage, they thought the batteries weren't rechargeable, and they were like, I don't understand your business model. It, it doesn't just charge from... <laughs> The solar once and discharge once and then you buy a new one, right? That's, yeah. that's not how it works. Yeah, because it, basically the thing that degrades is how much energy you can charge and discharge. So very slowly over time, your capacity reduces. And at some point that's going to become either too annoying to use or maybe not suitable anymore for the application. And at that point, you're not throwing it out, you're recycling, right? It, it can be made into a brand new battery that is fully effective all over again in a relatively closed route way. It's one of the most circular technologies that's out there, which is what the, is very ironic about the, the whole recycling discussion for batteries. Yeah, and the, the last thing I will say mm-hmm. about this, yeah. because it's also really important, a great point that was made by both Hans Eric Mellon from Circular Energy Storage, I don't know, you, you've had him on, but he would be a good person to talk about this, and Michael Libre, is if you look at that, the improvements we talked about, right? As costs come down and as density improves, in that same period, if over, say, a 10-year life of a, a battery or a 20-year life of the battery, you see a performance improvement at least as good as uh, the recycling rate, you have a forever circular loop, right? Because you start with, you, you make your first battery. If in 10 years' time, it takes 10% less material to make your new battery and your recycling rate is 90, then 90% of your battery from 10 years ago gives you exactly one new battery today without needing any more raw materials from the ground. So we very quickly go from actually needing to extract raw materials from the ground to a perfectly circular economy whilst these these improvement uh, rates. Yeah, that's the problem that people, big batteries, they think about lead acid batteries, which is, of course, lead is dangerous. And any other places, when we buy a AAA battery or any battery for everyday use, we are buying actually the energy. We are not buying a sort of a energy storage device, but batteries, as we are discussing, we are not buying energy. We are buying an energy storage device and the ability to store diminishes over time. It's not that energy mm-hmm. run out. So yeah, maybe someone need to come up with a different terms. It's it's really not a battery. It's a storage device or BESS. It's a battery-based mm-hmm. energy storage. So yeah. Yes. We have exactly to highlight so. that storage yeah. aspect, not a battery. Yeah, it's an important distinction because yeah, whilst the, the technology looks very similar, the difference between a rechargeable technology, which is going to be used tens of thousands of times versus buying a, a yeah, AA battery in a store where it's been charged all the way up, but it's only got that charge once. It's completely different, right? It's apples to oranges. But that's what people think when the battery is gone. Oh yeah, I just have to throw. 
coming back, we discussed a lot of interesting items, like a large-scale battery storage that when you look at them, do you give up, do you want to give a ballpark number, megawatt hour, how many, what's the size of land people need? Just a thumb rule. When, if you're designing a large 100 mm. megawatt hour project, what are the different numbers that we can take away? A good question. The challenge is, of course, storage is very scalable. So batteries you can build very small or very large, and it's largely linear within that. There are some efficiencies you as you go. Stackable is also, right? But, so generally, stackable is not advised. So, you, I mean, you can, but the problem is from a safety standpoint, usually you have what's called deflagration venting. There's two standards, NFPA 68 and 69. So basically passive safety measures and active safety measures. And usually those are on top of battery containers that if there is a, a, a thermal runaway and essentially it propagates, that it's going to firstly be restricted to the unit that it's come from. And second, that if there is anything like uh, explosive gas buildup, that the gas is safely released. And the last line of defense is if you have something that ignites an explosion, it goes upwards, right? And doesn't go outwards in form shrunk. So actually stacking batteries is not a good idea because then you have to find an alternative way to, to mitigate those sort of kind of safety measures, as well as you get into O&M access issues, right? Battery modules are 40 kilograms, swing like very heavy. You can't lift them without machinery. So if you create a multi-story, you end up having to build like a whole gantry structure around the, the systems. But having said that, battery energy storage systems are getting denser and denser. So the new sort of industry standard is in a 20-foot shipping container, and they're mm -hmm. generally built around 20-foot shipping containers for, for transport purposes. You can fit um, about five megawatt hours of battery storage in one of those containers. So when you look at it at a site level, obviously it depends on your choice of supplier because there's differences there. There's different power electronics equipment, but maybe somewhere around 40 or 50 kilowatt hours per square meter is what you can get to on average for a site. So you roughly use that as a rule of, of, uh, of thumb. So it's pretty compact in terms of footprint. And the average size you asked, that depends where you're connecting to, right? For a, a utility scale project these days, it's actually more commonly in the, uh, I would say, gigawatt hours of, of capacity than the hundreds of megawatt hours. But if you're connecting at a, a medium voltage level, like a, a medium distribution, it's more maybe like a 50 megawatt system of two or four hours, right? So 100 megawatts, 200 megawatt hours. But the utility scale systems at renewable projects or at large transmission uh, junctions are in the gigawatt hours these days. And it's a 20 foot container, five megawatt hour. So it's roughly about half a million dollars each. Are you just taking the cell cost there? Yeah, how, how much is the sort of roughly ballpark figure? Of course, we can build up the cost based on... There's lots of different ways to calculate. So I, the problem is exactly the one I mentioned earlier, which is if you ask for one unit, the prices can be very different yeah, to of a full utility scale project. So out of China, there's, there's sort of reports and benchmarks of prices around the kilowatt hour mark for grid scale turnkey mm -hmm. systems. Now, that's a very aggressive number. Equally, you can go to... Tesla's website, and then they have a, a you know, mega pack section, and you can look at the price of a mega pack as a reference. And the reality is likely to be somewhere in between the two, right? Because China is a particularly aggressive price competitive market, very low cost. And Tesla is one of the, the, the tier one Western integrators. So generally, when you're buying a larger number of units and products, you're going to end up somewhere between the two, unless you're in uh, unless you are in the Chinese domestic market. Yeah, I know you have to go. I just have one last quick question. I was thinking... What about putting batteries underground? Why you need to, okay, can't you, like, a, if you're growing solar, why can't you put batteries underground and grow vegetable or whatever on top, no? It would be cheaper. So that way. The, the, there are a few main reasons. The first is the cost of civil works then is going to be very, mm -hmm. very high for your project, right? You have to excavate and go underground. The second, the two biggest issues are heat and uh, safety, right? So batteries emit heat as they're operating. And so you need mm -hmm. to be able to dissipate that heat effectively. And in the open air, that's relatively straightforward to do. And batteries are being built in yeah, very hot climates, 50, 55 degrees, and they're able to operate if they're designed effectively. Underground, you're going to have to add in additional cooling active maybe measures to extract heat. That's reason one. And then reason two is, is the safety one, right? These facilities are designed to be unmanned. In general, batteries are a very safe technology, but when you're dealing with billions and billions of cells, you will occasionally get some that are flawed and you, that can ignite a, a thermal uh, runaway. And so whilst there are a lot of passive safety measures to, first of all, 
identify it before it happens and stop it, and then to avoid it from propagating. In a above ground scenario in an unmanned facility, there's very little risk beyond the insurance of property value, right? Have that situation, you don't need to do anything about it. In an underground space, that becomes a lot more challenging, right? Because smoke and heat will be contained. And so the, those are the two biggest reasons I would say you don't really see underground deaths aside from the cost element of having to, to build it. But of course it would, from at least a visual as aspect, people like putting things underground, whether they're power lines or, or infrastructure. So I can see why someone would ask. That's good. Thank you so much for your time. I know you have to go. Maybe we should connect another time and have a long discussion. I'm sure my listeners uh, will be coming back and connect with you. Uh, what's the best way to reach you? So, well, a number of different ways I have. So my personal website is mcubic.com. But if you Google my name, it should show up. And then I'm very particularly active on LinkedIn. So if you search for me on LinkedIn, Marek Kubik, M-A-R-E-K-U-B-I-K, you should be able to find me there and, uh, and yeah, drop me a message. Thank you so much. Any last minute comments you want to make or... I think I learned a lot today. No, I, I think it, it's a good discussion, right? And it, particularly because we had this talk about the small scale and the large scale and where each one's ha have a place. Maybe we have slightly different philosophical views of exactly how they're going to be distributed. But I, I think I would echo to say, regardless of if it's small scale or large scale, the trends that are there in, in grid scale battery storage around cost performance density mean it will be transforming the way we power the world very soon it isn't already thank you so much thank you thank you we hope you enjoy this episode of energy Preneurs. to continue listening to this conversation please visit us at energy Preneurs. thank you see you next time